In this screencast, we will talk about the solubility of weekly soluble salts. You might recall that we've talked about the Ka for weak acids, the Kb for weakly soluble salts, and the Ksp for weakly soluble salts. Ka acids, Kb bases, Ksb soluble salts, weakly soluble. <coughs> Excuse me. So, these are precipitation reactions, and in a precipitation reaction, you produce a salt. They're sometimes called exchange reactions. Sometimes they're called double displacement reactions. Uh, sometimes we call them a square dance reaction because we take our positive ion and the negative ion and another salt with its positive ion and its negative ion, and they swap partners. One of those partners is going to be a precipitate. The other partner, the other salt, I should say, is probably going to be soluble most of the time. And this is a reason why the reaction, of course, goes to the right. It's because you're producing a solid. Sometimes you might produce a molecule with a strong bond. When we did acids plus bases to make a salt, the molecule with a strong bond was water or HOH. Now, these precipitation reactions or exchange reactions, we're interested in knowing, for example, what is the solubility, to what extent will calcium carbonate dissolve? And there's a little bit of a irony here or contradiction, which we're going to have to live with, and that is that when we say a salt is insoluble, what we really mean is it doesn't measure up or meet a standard of solubility. You might recall that any time a salt will dissolve to the extent of one gram per hundred grams of water, we say that that salt is soluble. And if it's less than a tenth of a gram per 100 grams of water, we say it is insoluble. So the term insoluble does not mean not soluble at all, but it means it doesn't pass this threshold, the threshold of a tenth of gram. And anything that's in between here is considered to be partially soluble, but there aren't too many salts that are like that. <clears throat> a lot of these insoluble salts have very beautiful colors and form very interesting and intriguing um, and beautiful crystals. We'll talk a little bit more about that perhaps later. So we've looked at the solubility of salts from a qualitative point of view, whether or not they are soluble. And you can usually tell that by whether or not when you add a little bit, you end up getting a precipitate pretty quickly, settling to the bottom of the beaker. But now we want to go quantitative. And in order to go quantitative, we have to remember something. And that is if I have a beaker and I'm putting my salt into the beaker. And of course, this little wavy line here means that this is water, not that there would be waves, obviously. But when we put the salt in water, we can't add salt pound after pound after pound. Eventually, we add so much salt that there's not room for any more salt in the solution, and so it precipitates out. And at this point, we are now in equilibrium. That means the at the same time that some of my positive and negative ions are combining to make a salt, and why that happens and things get erased is hard to know, but... At the same time, ions are coming together to make a precipitate. Some of the precipitate redissolves back into solution. And so as a result, we have an equilibrium situation. This is a physical equilibrium, not a chemical equilibrium. So, for example, if we come down here and look at silver bromide, if we put some silver bromide into water, very, very quickly, the water becomes saturated. 
And that's because if we were to measure the solubility of the silver ion and the solubility of the bromide ion, you can see that it's in the range of about a millionth of a molar. 7.35 could round up to 10, and 10 times 10 to the minus 7th gives me 10 to the minus 6th, and that's a millionth of a molar. And since this is a one-to-one -one ratio, we have a millionth molar of my silver ions and a millionth molar of my bromide ions in this saturated solution. When we multiply those two molarities, when the solution is saturated together, we come up with the KSP. And the KSP, the SP stands for solubility product. Product, of course, means we're multiplying together. Right there, we are multiplying the solubility of the silver ion times the solubility of the bromide ion. Hence the term solubility product, the product of two solubilities. And here is our KSP when we multiply this number times this number. Normally, of course, you are going to be given a big long table or chart containing lots and lots of solubilities for lots of different salts, and you have to look up the salt that you're interested in. Now, if we were going to make the uh, KSP expression, which we already did up here, you can see it's the molarity of the silver ion, silver is a plus one ion, times the molarity of the bromide ion, and they are both raised to the power of one, which we don't bother to show. In other words, the coefficients become the exponents. If we make this generic, equation 18.6 is generic, and we have some salt with a positive cation represented by the letter A and a negative anion represented by the letter B, and the cation has, the, has a char charge of X, and the, um, or I should say it takes X cations and Y anions in order to make a salt, something that you learned way back in first-year chemistry. And it completely dissociates in water. You're going to have X of your cations, and you're going to have Y of your anions. And the reason for the X and Y is because this was the charge of your cation, and this was the charge of your anion. So if we use a couple of examples, and we talk about calcium fluoride, here we have a 1 to 2 ratio. For every one calcium, we're going to make two fluorides. Please do not make the mistake of, instead of writing this, writing something like this, because there's no such thing. Remember, you have a calcium ion in a crystalline structure with a fluoride, fluoride on one side and a fluoride on the other side. So the two fluorides are not connected to each other, even though you have the small letter 2. That follows the F. So you produce one calcium ion and two fluoride ions. So when you go to write the KSP expression, you take the calcium ion, and its coefficient was a 1. The fluoride ion, its coefficient is a 2. And that is your expression. Later on, if we knew the molarity of the calcium ion, we could put it in there. And the molarity of the fluoride ion might be twice the molarity of the calcium ion if all of the calcium and fluoride ions came from your original calcium fluoride. However, if the calcium ions are coming from a soluble calcium salt and the fluoride ions are coming from a soluble fluoride salt in a double displacement um, or exchange reaction, that means that the source of the calciums is from one place, the source of the fluorides is from another place, and they are not in a one to two ratio necessarily. It all depends upon the molarities of those two soluble salts when you mix them together. And then over here we have our silver sulfide. In this particular case, our calcium, our cation gets the, the exponent of two, and our anion gets the exponent of one. And here's a very small table of KSPs. And you should notice that the salt that has the smallest 
value, the, the one with the smallest exponent, 10 to the minus 13, is the least soluble. And the one which has the largest in this table, um, exponent minus 5, that is the most soluble. Remember that 10 to the minus 5 is many times greater than 10 to the minus 13. This distance from 5 to 13 is 8, and 10 to the 8th power, you'll recall, is 100 million. So that means my calcium sulfate is 100 million times more soluble than my silver bromide. And yet both salts would be called insoluble because neither salt meets the threshold of one gram or more per 100 mils of water. And so you are reminded here, do not confuse solubility of a compound with the KSP. So the solubility, which is the maximum amount you can dissolve, we use brackets to represent the concentration or the molarity of that, is not the same thing as the KSP. And of course, you can tell that from your KSP expression. For example, if we come down and look here, here's the KSP, but here's your molarities. Obviously, they're not the same thing, but sometimes students make that mistake. So let's go back and let's do an example problem. We have calcium fluoride, and it happens to be the main component of this mineral. Remember, minerals are seldom pure, and it dissolves to a slight extent in water. So the first thing you should always do, write your equilibrium expression. Write the equation for the equilibrium expression. It's always step one. If you don't know anything else to do yet, always write your equilibrium expression, which means to dissociate the ions into the cations and the anions. The second step should always be, now, write your KSP expression. Even if you're not quite sure yet how you're going to solve this problem, you can always write the equation and then the expression making sure that, in this case, since we have a 1 to 2 ratio, I have an exponent of 1 and an exponent of 2. Now, the next thing we can do is begin to try to solve the problem. We want to calculate the KSP if the calcium ion concentration has been found to be this molarity. And that molarity is much less than a tenth of a gram per 100 grams of water. So, when we go to plug in our data, step number three is plug in your data. So if my calcium ion concentration is 2.3 times 10 to the minus fourth, I plug that in here. And then for my fluoride concentration, since all the fluorides are coming from the same place that all the calciums are coming from, that is to say, a single salt, I have a 1 to 2 ratio. That means that this number comes in here, but it's times 2. I have to double the molarity because it's a 1 to 2 ratio. We still keep the same exponents of 1 and 2. And that bothers students sometimes. The 1 to 2 ratio is required by reality. It's required by the real world because we have a 1 to 2 ratio of calcium ions to fluoride ions when the calcium fluoride dissociates to the extent possible. The 1 exponent and the 2 exponent are there because that's by definition. That's something we made up. And so this 1 and this 2 play a double role. They play a one and a two, a twice as much molarity rate because of reality, but the exponents are one and two by definition. And you've got to do both of them. Now, this little section right here is just a reminder that many minerals and gems um, are made out of these types of very insoluble salts 
because after all, if they were soluble, they would all dissolve and you wouldn't find them in the, in the natural realm. You would have to make them in the laboratory by evaporating out water from a, a solution. But in the real world, these, of course, are very insoluble, which is why you can find these gems in various places in the environment. Oftentimes, the kind of ground or crust or strata where you find this would be somewhat volcanic and that you would have all these minerals dissolved in the molten rock and then as it cools and as water evaporates, it leaves behind these saturated solutions which eventually dry out, leaving behind these minerals. So you need to go to a place often where there's igneous rock as opposed to sedimentary um, or uh, metamorphic in order to find these minerals. And so, for example, you can have metal oxides, you can have metal silicates, you can have metallic carbonates, you can have metallic hydroxides, and you can have metallic sulfides, and you can have metallic halides. Any kind of anion you can think of just about, you can create various, um, uh, you can discover or there exist various kinds of minerals and gems, many of which are very, very beauty, beautiful. And of course, the purer they are, the more you're going to see the faces of the uh, geometrical unit cells that make them up. You might remember that from a previous unit. Okay, just a little reminder right here. The KSP values for insoluble salts can be used to do two things. To estimate the solubility of the solid salt or determine whether or not you're going to get a precipitate. You might be given several concentrations and you don't know whether you have a precipitate or not. And in those kinds of problems, we, we do everything that we do we're doing before, except we call it Q instead of K. And just like in a previous chapter, um, then we're going to compare K to the KSP to see which is bigger. If Q is bigger, that means we are past our saturation point and we're going to have a precipitate. If, K, if the KSP is bigger than Q, it means we have not saturated the, the solution yet. So let's look at another example here. Here we have the mineral barium sulfate, and we're told that um, the KSP value is right there, and it's standard procedure to specify the temperature, because remember, equilibrium constants are different at different temperatures. So what are the steps? Step number one, immediately write out the equilibrium equation. Step number two, immediately. Write out the KSP based upon that equation. At least get those things down. On an AP test, if you're rushed for time, at least get that down. If you have to skip the rest of the problem, that should go quickly. Now, when it comes to plugging in some data, we can use an ice chart to plug in some data. And so we have our barium sulfate right here. And as soon as you put some of that into water, we're going to go from zero molarity, which is what you have before you place it into water. And as soon as you place it into water, X of these barium sulfates are going to split up, which means you're going to get X positive ions and you're going to get X negative ions because they're in a one-to-one -one ratio. It's like saying for every square dance couple, if you have like five square dance couples and they all split up, you're going to get five guys and you're going to get five girls, uh, just in case that sounds confusing. So if X of these barium sulfates, a very small percentage of the overall barium sulfate split up, we're going to get X barium ions and X sulfate ions, which means at equilibrium, you're going to have X and X. And so when we go to plug these into our equilibrium expression, we're going to be plugging in an X there, and we're going to be plugging in an X there. And so basically you have X squared equals my KSP.
And if we finish the problem, now we just have to take the square root of each side, and that gives me the molarity of both my barium ion and my sulfate ion. And just for the record, barium sulfate just ha does have a very practical application. It's opaque to x-rays, which means that x-rays have trouble going through it. Just like x-rays don't go through bone, but x-rays do go through soft tissue, the x-rays will not go through barium sulfate. So if you're trying to image soft tissue, something that's not a bone, such as a stomach and a small intestine and then a large intestine, like in this picture here, um, that allows you to use x-rays, which is a readily available technology, to gain an image of something that has soft tissue. And then you can look to see if something is leaking out somewhere or if there's a blockage or something looks particularly swollen and out of the ordinary. Now back to our problem, we want to wrap things up. Once you know what the molarity is, then you can multiply by the molar mass and convert it into grams per liter. And you can see again that we are much, much less. We are much, much less than 0.1 grams per 100 grams of water. Because this is point. 0024 grams per a thousand grams of water. Let's look at another example real quickly. This, in this case, um, we're going to have a compound that has a one to two ratio, magnesium fluoride. KSP is given. Doesn't look like they mentioned the temperature in this particular problem, though they should. And so, what are the steps? One, write the dissociation equation. Two, write the equilibrium expression, remembering that it's a one to two ratio. Step number three, find the numbers that you're going to plug in to your equilibrium expression. If you start off with zero magnesium and zero fluoride ions, and the magnesium fluoride that you now dump in begins to dissociate, it's going to dissociate in a one to two ratio. For every 1x, you're going to get 2x. So that means that you're going to be substituting an x in for magnesium and a 2x in for fluoride. And this is where a lot of people make mistakes because that 2x, you'll notice, is squared. And 2x squared is going to give you 4x squared. So if we come over to... Here, I, I, and we multiply the 4x squared times x, we get 4x cubed. And now you have to be able to find the cubed root of something on your calculator. You might want to review that. This little piece right here reminds you of uh, the, the process of finding KSPs from molarities and molarities from KSPs and what's going on. Is in, and they're using uh, lead Roman numeral 2 chloride as an example in this illustration. It says reactions of ions, particularly anions with water, often make form complex ions. And that's often in the process of hydrolysis. Well, that is more important in a later chapter. And here's the reminder that the 2 shows up in two places. It shows up in the 1 to 2 ratio, and that's because that's the way that the reality of the crystal is, two anions for every one cation. And it also shows up as an exponent, and that is by definition. Now, this right here tells us that the relative solubility of salts can often be deduced by simply looking at the KSPs. Now, the one thing that you have to be careful about is that you can only ca compare KSPs if all the KSPs you're comparing are one-to-one -one, 
or if all the KSPs you're comparing are 1 to 2, or all the KSPs you're comparing are 2 to 1, or something like that. You can't compare the 1 to 1 to the 1 to 2s and automatically assume the smaller KSP is less soluble. In other words, you can't compare apples to oranges. And they remind you of that here. Direct comparisons of solubility only work when you have the same cation to anion ratio. And they give you an example here using silver iodide, which is a one-to-one -one ratio, and lead to iodide, which is a one-to-two ratio. And you might immediately jump to the conclusion, well, look how insoluble the silver iodide is, um, because it's um, 10 to the minus 17th. Um, and, but you need to be careful because, and it doesn't seem to show up here as readily, but you actually have to do the math in order to make sure you know which of these two ions is... Uh, uh, wait a minute, let me back up a little bit. I'm going to erase that part and come over here. I meant to look here. So if your KSP is um, 10 to the minus 13, and down here it's 10 to the minus 6, but um, you're, you can see that when you do the math for the silver chloride and for the lead Roman numeral 2 chloride and complete your calculations, it turns out this becomes much less soluble than this. I have to go back and read that again. Um, but the main point is, do the math when you're comparing two salts that do not have the same cation to anion ratio.